Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Maria Lourdes P.A. Sereno, Chief Justice of the Republic of the Philippines. remain standing for the entry of colors. the Philippine National Anthem. Bayang magiliw Pernas ng silanganan Alam ng puso Sa dibdib mo'y buhay Lupang hinirang Duyan ka ng magiting Sa Kapasisiir sa dagat at pundok sa simoy at sa langit mong bukhaw may dilag ang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal ang kislap ng wataw at mo'y tagumpay na nagniningning ang bituin at araw niya kailan Pa may di magdidilim Lupa ng araw Nang uwan Hatid pagsit ka Puyil ng it Sa piling mo Aming ligaya Na pag may mga api Ang mamatay na
Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the presentation ceremonies of the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Awards, which today celebrates 55 years of honoring greatness of spirit. We present to you a tribute to these 55 years. No one pays much attention to the ordinary until they restore democracy, feed the hungry, save the seas, or protect the dignity of a people. For how can one see greatness in the unassuming, the soft-spoken, the frail, or the humble, if it's measured by the usual yardstick of success. The man whose name now bears Asia's most prestigious award seemed ordinary by all means, except that even as a mechanic, he already had the sense to improve the lives of his fellow men. What is it about ordinary men and women who turn their back on a comfortable life so they can clean up oceans and light up villages. How can they know that what they fight for will make governments sit up and listen? What moves these ordinary people to do extraordinary things? It's called greatness of spirit. It is celebrated every 31st of August by the Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation as a fitting homage to the legacy of the Philippine president who was once called Man of the Masses. He believed that the little man is entitled to a little bit more of everything and that no one's dignity should ever be compromised. Today, over 300 ordinary men and women have displayed the same conviction and courage to transform society and thus have been honored with the Ramon Magsaysay Award. For protecting fundamental human rights. For encouraging the poor to become asset creators. Or for just playing music that colors the mind. And while the award can boost ordinary men and women to celebrity, many of the winners use it to enable them to work much harder for the communities they serve because they know that the award is not about them, but about the solutions they make. That's how ordinary men and women become extraordinary. The Chair of the Board of Trustees, Juan B. Santos. Honorable Chief Justice Sereno, former President Ramos, other officials of the Philippine government, Senator Jun Magsaysay, Mila Magsaysay Valenzuela, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Magsaysay awardees, fellow trustees, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. For 55 years, the Ramon Magsaysay Foundation has relentlessly scored Asia in search of ordinary people doing extraordinary deeds in order to exalt them, to make them known to the world, and to have them inspire the rest of us to do even a fraction of what they have accomplished. The Foundation has brought the world's attention to some 300 awardees through all these years, reminding mankind that pure and simple goodness 
does reside in the heart of man, and that it is powerful enough to triumph over the greatest of odds, especially when driven to create, protect, or restore the greater good. Two things quite unrelated give me pause as I ponder on the history of the Foundation and review the stories of our bodies past, recent, and present. First, is the much talked about concept of inclusive development. The term inclusive in this context is fairly new, but the concept is certainly as old as time. The idea of development trickling down to the lowest level of the socio-economic pyramid. In fact, beloved late President Ramon Magsaysay himself was a proponent. Remember one of the more famous lines in his credo, and I quote, He who has less in life must have more in law. Those words were uttered over five decades ago, but the message of inclusivity or social equality was just as loud and clear then as it is today. Strictly speaking, inclusive development is defined as growth, creating economic opportunities, and making this accessible to all, particularly the poor. When I think of the marvelous feats of our awardees have done and how this made millions of lives better in the poorest of the poor communities, I see shining examples of the inclusive development. This may not exactly be in the realm of creating equal economic opportunities, but the far-reaching penetration of social, health, and even moral benefits to people who need them most makes our awardees' deeds as good as inclusive. But then I ask myself, are these deeds inclusive enough? Or are they still exclusive only to their communities and the immediate neighbors? Can they still expand the reach to include as much of Asia as possible? The second concern that tugs at my mind is the emerging digital age generation, or the so-called millennials. These are today's generation of teenagers and 20-somethings who have never known life without computers, mobile phones, gadgets, and the internet. Studies indicate that the digital world they were born to has shaped them very differently from you and me. They are constantly wired to the World Wide Web and wirelessly at that. For better or for worse, the millennials have been raised with a highly developed sense of self-esteem and self-worth, so much so that they feel that the world owes them. So then, I can't help but ask myself, are the Ramon Magsaysay Awards relevant to this generation? Does giving recognition to selfless and heroic deeds of Asian men and women mean anything to them? Or are they simply so engrossed in making sure they look good in their selfish shots that they couldn't care any less about anything else? Inclusive development and digital age millennials, two very different and disparate concerns, yet both come to mind as I reflect on this year's Ramon Magsaysay Awards. Our awardees, as in previous years, exemplify the ideals that make the late President Ramon Magsaysay the immortal personification of greatness of spirit in selfless service to the people of Asia. From the Philippines, we have Dr. Ernesto Domingo. From war-torn Afghanistan, we have another doctor, Dr. Habiba Sarabi. From another war-weary country, Myanmar, we have Lekpai Seng Rao.
from Indonesia. We have Komisi Pen Paran Tarasan Cor Corrupsi or Corruption Eradication Commission. From Nepal, we have Sakti Samuha or Power Group. As we honor them tonight, let us also ask ourselves, how do we maximize the good that they have done to their respective communities? How do we multiply the benefits to make them even more inclusive? How do we get our young people to sit up and take notice, to post viral stories about our Asian heroes? How can we inspire these millennials to use their digital savviness and other distinct characteristics to make a positive difference in Asia? As many of you may know by now, the Foundation just recently launched the Magsaysay Institute of Transformative Leadership, or MITL. While its overall objective is to promote Asia-based transformative leadership practices, the two-pronged mission is perfectly aligned with the challenges of inclusive developments and the digital obsession of today's young people. Mission one is to create a synergy among the Magsaysay awardees and other Asian leaders in search for co collaborative solutions to emerging issues. By linking our awardees and leaders with one another, we hope to strengthen and widen their impact and ultimately multiply the beneficial effects of the solutions they offer. Mission two is to awaken the greatness of spirit among our young people and potential leaders in Asia through exposure to the Magsaysay awardees and other examples of transformative leadership. By exposing the Asian youth to the works and stories of our awardees, we hope to make them realize that the world is not only about them, but that they have in them to help alleviate the problems of this world. Inclusive development and self-absorbed millennials. I find immense satisfaction in knowing that these two seemingly unrelated challenges find themselves side by side as the twin mission of the Magsaysay Institute of Transformative Leaders. The MITL is indeed the perfect next step to our Ramon Magsaysay Awards. Our reason for being has not changed over the years. That is, to recognize and thus perpetuate the greatness of spirit in the service of our people. Let us move forward to translating our work in the foundation in doable programs that can benefit as much of Asia and perhaps even the world as possible and use this to ignite the energy and passion of our youth to get them involved in meaningful and socially uplifting work in the real world. Only then can Dr. Ernesto Domingo, Dr. Habiba Sarabi, Lekpai Sengrao, the KPK, the Sakti Samuha, and all other Magsaysay awardees before and after them make their work truly inclusive as well as perpetually relevant to all generations to come. Please join us in the foundation and the MITL in this mission of ours. For now, it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's presentation of the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Awards. Let the celebration of Asian greatness begin. The members of the Board of Trustees will now read the citations for the 2013 awardees.
the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, Ernesto Domingo. Inequity in healthcare is the single most important health problem in many countries in the world. In the Philippines, where government health financing is weak, such inequity has been catastrophic in its effects. The nation's poor are effectively deprived of access to quality and affordable health care and suffer starkly higher mortality from preventable and treatable diseases. Building a public health system that includes and benefits all is an urgent national challenge. Ernesto Domingo has dedicated most of his career in medical research and education to this challenge. A well-respected yet self-effacing specialist in hepatology and gastroenterology Domingo has always valued the social side of his profession, devoting over four decades to the University of the Philippines, Manila, UPM. Passionate about science, he organized the UPM Liver Study Group and led groundbreaking studies which established the causative connection between chronic hepatitis B and liver cancer. Further determining the preventive solution to liver cancer, the immunization of newborns against hepatitis B within 24 hours from birth, which reduces the probability of acquiring hepatitis by 95%, his research has saved millions of people from the danger of life-threatening illness. Deeply concerned about the poor's access to health care, he has pushed for hepatitis vaccination to become mandatory and available to all. Working closely with legislators, he has also lobbied for a law that ensures annual budgetary support for neonatal hepatitis immunization. From groundbreaking scientific discovery to policy advocacy, to securing implementation resources, he has painstakingly demonstrated how medical science can truly protect and promote the quality of life of everyone, especially the poor. His public health advocacy extends to an even wider field. In 2008, Domingo and his distinguished colleagues formed the Universal Health Care Study Group, a group committed to advancing through research and advocacy the goal of universal health care in the Philippines. Based on intensive studies of the country's health system, the group produced a blueprint for universal health care and then actively campaigned for its adoption when the current administration assumed power in 2010. And he has gone on to head, without compensation, the Department of Health's Research Reference Hub, which manages all health-related researches and translates research results into policies and plans in the government's health care program. Domingo is heartened to see that the, with the government's commitment to Kalusugang Pangkalahatan, the Department of Health's budget has doubled in three short years. A greater focus on health equity issues has led to some 80% of the population now enrolled in the National Health Insurance Program. And public health care delivery capacities are being upgraded. Domingo says, and I quote, medicine is basically a social science. When you deal with families and communities, it cannot be anything else." Unquote. 
This conviction is behind his visionary reforms in health education and human resources, such as greater social content in medical education and a shift from a doctor-centered system by empowering nurses, midwives, and other health workers in rural communities. In electing Ernesto Domingo to receive the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, the Board of Trustees recognizes his exemplary embrace of the social mission of his medical science and profession, his steadfast leadership in pursuing health for all as a shared moral responsibility of all sectors, and his groundbreaking and successful advocacy for neonatal hepatitis vaccination, thereby saving millions of lives in the Philippines. The 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, Komisi Pembarantasan Korupsi. Corruption is truly a social cancer. It undermines the development, erodes public trust in government, weakens the state, and infects the morals of society. Its effects are devastating, particularly in developing nations whose people can ill afford its cost. One such nation is Indonesia, for many years ranked among, quote, the most corrupt countries in the world, end of quote. Today, however, Indonesia has one of the most admired campaigns against corruption, a campaign that began when the Indonesian government passed a law creating Komisi Pembarantasan Korupsi, KPK, or the Corruption Eradication Commission in 2002. Rampant and systemic corruption had long been a festering issue in Indonesia. Different anti-corruption bodies were created since the 50s but these were mostly short-lived showcase pieces, sabotaged by lack of serious political will. With the return of democratic rule, Indonesians decided that they had had enough and resolved to take the problem by the horns. Civil society initiatives and pressure from international organizations led to a strongly crafted law establishing KPK as an independent government body with a far-reaching mandate, exercising exceptional powers that range from investigation and prosecution to prevention and the coordination of agencies authorized to combat corruption. KPK 
can conduct searches and seizures, freeze assets, impose travel bans, compel cooperation from government agencies, and even intercept communications without prior judicial approval. But KPK's powers are not just prosecutorial. They are preventive as well. It carries out audits on officials, undertakes public awareness campaigns, and studies government management systems to reduce the potential for corruption. Led collectively by five commissioners and with selected non-government representation, KPK has a highly professional workforce, capacitated with cutting-edge technologies and governed by a strongly enforced internal code of ethics. Its accomplishments have been impressive. In 10 years, KPK has handled 332 high-profile cases involving top government officials. Of these, 169 cases have been processed in court, and KPK has choked up an amazing 100% conviction rate. Over seven years, KPK has returned to the state treasury, recovered assets worth rupia 805.6 billion, or more than $80 million. Less spectacular, <laughs> but exceedingly important are KPK's preventive programs which include tightening rules on wealth reporting by public officials, closing opportunities for corruption in operational systems, and setting up so-called integrity zones in the bureaucracy. For the Indonesian public, anti-corruption education has been introduced at all educational levels, and innovative campaigns have been undertaken, like the honesty shops, where customers pay for what they get by simply depositing the appropriate amount in a box. KPK has faced harassment and intimidation, interagency feuds, slashed budgets, but KPK has also built up a formidable base of public support. When it locked horns with the national police, thousands staged public demonstrations supporting KPK. When the parliament refused to allocate funds for a much needed KPK building, Indonesian citizens voluntarily donated money for the building construction. After a decade of work, KPK has become a symbol of reform and hope for Indonesians, and he's hailed as one of the few effective anti-corruption agencies in the world. In electing Komisi Pambarantasan Korupsi to receive the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, the Board of Trustees recognizes its fiercely independent and successful campaign against corruption in Indonesia, combining the uncompromising 
prosecution of erring powerful officials with far-sighted reforms in governance systems and the educated promotion of vigilance, honesty, and active citizenship among all Indonesians. The 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, Lapay Seng Ro. <laughs> Myanmar is a country caught between its past and the future. The past is one of decades of ethnic strife and 50 years of a brutal military dictatorship that plunged the country into isolation and continuing underdevelopment. With the general elections in 2010, Myanmar has taken its first steps towards a more open and democratic future by ending its isolation and instituting a civilian government. The past, however, is not quite past, and in creating its future, Myanmar is faced with complex and difficult challenges. A 64-year-old widow and member of the Kachin ethnic minority, Lapai Seng Ro is at the forefront in facing these challenges. As a student at Yangon University, she personally experienced the military's abusive rule when she was detained on the suspicion of connections with the Akachin insurgency. In 1987, she began to do relief work for internally di displaced peoples in the Myanmar-China border. In 1997, Seng Ro took the bold step of establishing in military ruled Burma the NG called, NGO called Meta Development Foundation. Meta addressed the problems of population displacement and emergency relief in the country's conflict zones, starting where fighting between Kachin rebels and government forces had already displaced over 70,000 people. Seng Ro has always been concerned that Meta build trust among all stakeholders through joint efforts in comprehensive, participative, long-term interventions. In agriculture, it has established more than 600 farmer field schools, capacitating over 50,000 farmers in improved farm and forest management. Meta also established schools and training centers in early childhood education. It introduced community managed water, health, and sanitation systems and other health care projects. Meta provided funding and technical support for a wide range of livelihood projects. In 2008, when tropical cyclone Nargis devastated Myanmar, Meta was, was entrusted to lead a massive rehabilitation, reconstruction, and development effort covering large sections of the country and benefiting hundreds of thousands of cyclone victims. Under Seng Ro's leadership, Meta has grown to be the largest NGO in Myanmar 
with a staff of 600 branches outside Yangon and three research and training centers. Its programs have reached over 600,000 people in 2,352 communities. Working in a war-torn and socially fractured country, Seng Ro has shown both amazing courage and a unique ability to work with both government and rebels. In addressing conflict and instability, she knows it is essential to build a foundation of stable, self-reliant communities. Thus, she had advocated an inclusive peace and reconciliation process in Myanmar. She has herself been an example of inclusiveness, an embodiment of what meta means, loving kindness. A Kachin Christian, hence twice a member of the minority, she has demonstrated tact and openness as a leader working harmoniously with various groups across ethnic, religious, and political divides. In 2012, she deliberately relinquished her position as Meta's executive director to empower a new generation of leaders. Still, she remains active in the NGO community and in peace and development efforts. In electing Lapai Seng Ro to receive the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, the Board of Trustees recognizes her quietly inspiring and inclusive leadership in the midst of deep ethnic divides and prolonged armed conflict to regenerate and empower damaged communities and to strengthen local NGOs in promoting a non-violent culture of participation and dialogue as the foundation for Myanmar's peaceful future. The 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, Habibas Sarabi. <clears throat> there are few places in the world where the challenge of governance is as daunting and dangerous as in Afghanistan. Ravaged by foreign powers, warlordism, civil war, and the Taliban's regime of vicious fundamentalism, Afghanistan is now on a perilous process of democratic state building and development. But the odds are extremely forbidding. It is a place and time when true examples of hope are urgently needed. One shining example is Habiba Sarabi, a 57-year-old doctor who, in a fiercely patriarchal society, is the only female governor in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and the first woman to hold this position in the country's history. <clears throat> of a relatively privileged background, Sarabi was a professor at the Kabul Medical Science College when the Taliban took power in 1996 and imposed draconian measures on the population, particularly women. Fleeing to Pakistan to ensure that her children could continue their education, she became a teacher and an activist. With other Afghan women, she organized the Humanitarian Assistance for the Women and Children of Afghanistan, or HOKA and conducted women's rights classes and medical services in refugee camps. 
At great personal risk, she also secretly traveled on foot back and forth across the mountainous Pakistan-Afghanistan border to supervise underground literacy courses in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. After the fall of the Taliban, Sarabi immediately set up the Hauka office in Kabul, resumed teaching at the Medical Science College, and continued her volunteer work in literacy and women's rights. Her work brought her public notice. In 2003, Sarabi was appointed to head the Ministry of Women's Affairs, and in 2005, governor of Bamiyan, a poor agricultural province in the country's central highlands. In these positions, Sarabi vigorously pushed her advocacies for public education and women empowerment. In Bamiyan, public education has not only expanded. Now, 45% of the school pupils are female. There are now 20 women in the police force, and more women are taking up careers that were forbidden in the Taliban regime. As governor, Sarabi has effectively worked with various stakeholders in road construction and other infrastructure projects, agricultural development and improvement of health facilities, and health workers. Recognizing Bamiyan's natural, historical, and archaeological assets and their potential for ecotourism, she pioneered in establishing the 570-kilometer Band-e-Amir National Park, Afghanistan's first national park. In the Afghan context of continuing violence, political uncertainty, and weak institutions, Sarabi's accomplishments are truly inspiring. A member of an ethnic and religious minority, she is of the Hazara tribe and Shiite Muslim, Sarabi lives and works in a society where ethnic conflicts are deadly. And in the face of widespread hostility towards women assuming public roles, her courage and determination are astounding. Asked what drives her, she says simply but firmly, I am not a warlord. I am just a modern woman. <clears throat> In electing Habiba Sarabi to receive the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, the Board of Trustees recognizes her bold exercise of leadership to build up a functioning local government against great odds intractable political adversities, a harsh and impoverished environment, and pervasive cultural discrimination. Serving her people with a hopeful persistence grounded in her abiding commitment to peace and development in Afghanistan. The 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, Shakti Samuha. <clears throat> human trafficking is one of the most abominable crimes in human history. The traffic in persons by means of coercion and deception for commercial sex exploitation, forced labor, or slavery is an alarming global phenomenon. It plagues a country like Nepal, where poverty, illiteracy, unemployment, and the suppression of women's rights in law and tradition have fueled the problem. Estimates indicate that as many as 10,000 women and children are trafficked annually from Nepal to India for prostitution exploitation. 
1996, nearly 300 trafficked Nepali girls were rescued in a police raid in the brothels of Mumbai, India. Kept in harsh semi-detention for another six months, they could not be repatriated because, as female minors, they were not given citizenship papers by the Nepal government. Traumatized, stigmatized, and disowned by their families, their prospects of reintegration were difficult and dim. A small group of these survivors, however, bravely decided that if society and their own families had abandoned them, then they would have to take control of their lives by themselves. Ages 15 to 18, these trafficking victims banded themselves into a group they boldly called Shakti Samuha, or in English, Power Group, with the aim of empowering other trafficking survivors so that they can lead a dignified life. Shakti Samuha is the world's first anti-trafficking NGO created and run by trafficking survivors themselves. With the help of partner organizations, Shakti Samuha has amazingly accomplished much in helping female trafficking victims, as well as women and children at risk of being victimized. The group established Shakti Kendra in Kathmandu, a halfway home that provides survivors shelter, medical care, counseling, legal aid, educational support, skills training, and startup loans for income-generating activities. Targeting women and girls at risk, Shakti Samuha also set up an emergency shelter in Pokhara, where diverse support services are offered for street children, child laborers, and girls at risk. They have carried out awareness-raising programs in trafficking-prone districts in Kathmandu, targeting slums and establishments like dance bars, massage parlors, and carpet factories. Community-based child protection committees conduct training for groups including the police and media, such as street theater, which is used in their campaign against trafficking and domestic violence. Pushing the campaign to the policy level, Shakti Samuha helped develop protocols for the repatriation of traffic victims significantly influenced the, frames, the framing of Nepal's 2007 Human Trafficking Act and the creation of an anti-trafficking unit in the Ministry of Women, Children, and Social Welfare. They are also lobbying to revise citizenship laws that are gender discriminatory and that obstruct the reintegration of trafficked women. Shakti Samuha has now reached 15,000 people in its awareness-raising activities, rehabilitated and reintegrated 678 trafficking and domestic violence victims, and supported the livelihood and education of 670 women. Bonded by a common experience, the group's founders and the 500 trafficked women who now constitute its membership are relentless in their drive to help themselves and others like them. As one member declares, and I quote, Nowadays, I am ready to fight, to argue, and debate against threats and stigmatization. We are trafficking survivors, but no less capable than others in society. Unquote. In electing Shakti Samuha, to receive the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Award, the Board of Trustees recognizes its founders and members for transforming their lives in service to other human trafficking survivors, for their passionate dedication towards rooting out a pernicious social evil in Nepal, and for the radiant example they have shown the world in reclaiming the human dignity 
that is the birthright of all abused women and children everywhere. The 2013 awardees will now give their response. Ernesto Domingo of the Philippines. Honorable Chief Justice, former President Fidel Ramos, Trustees of the Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation, distinguished guests, fellow awardees, and friends. I had the privilege of meeting President Ramon Magsaysay in person and shaking his hand. That was in 1953 when I graduated from high school. He was our commencement speaker. As I vividly recall, he was a physically imposing man with a handshake to match. His physical attribute was complemented by an equally formidable moral certitude, very much appreciated by his people. Such appreciation was copiously expressed by the tears upon his untimely de death. It is a humbling experience to be offered an award established in his memory. In my more than half a century of involvement in the fields of medical research, health profession, education, and training, academic administration, and advocacy, the most formidable challenge I have had to contend with is bridging the chasm that isolates excellence from relevance. The divide between the two is ac accurately articulated by the comment of a colleague in the Department of Medicine, Medicine who said, and I quote, the department's evolution has been characterized by a recurring confrontation between the ideals of excellence and relevance. The excellence we aim for is often measured in terms of academic achievements. However, the people's need is our only yardstick for relevance. Thus, what may be academically excellent may be outright relevant, while that what is relevant may not require excellence at all. What my co-workers and I have attempted to do is to bridge this chasm between excellence and relevance. Our strategy is to make available to advocacy the output of medical research, innovative and open radical health professional education and training and health system study. Our advocacy is focused on mitigating inequity in health. We are voluntarily helping the Department of Health in its effort to implement the Aquino Health Agenda Kalusugang Pangkalahatan or Universal Health Care. As a solution to inequities in health, Universal Health Care has proven its efficacy worldwide. We should not be an exception. If these efforts merit your award, then I accept it without for a moment forgetting that many colleagues and my family too have generously contribute, contributed to this enterprise. Thank you. Komisi Pemberantasan Korupsi of Indonesia, represented today by Pa Abraham Samad, Chair, and Pa Adnan Pandu Praja, Vice Chair.
Honorable Chief Justice, Trustee of the Raman Magsasai War Foundation, distinguished guests, fellow awardees, and friends. It is a great honor for me standing here on behalf of my institution to receive this award. This moment is a declaration of our conviction to speak louder and harder. We fight against corruption all the way until the end. This award is warning that we are at war based on zero-sum principle. This is a signal to alert everybody. No mercy, no forgiveness, zero tolerance, and justice must prevail. I receive this award not only for my institution, but for those who dedicate themselves to seek justice, to those who tirelessly or enrich themselves fighting against corruption. I say to them, you are all heroes of humanity. You are all saving human civilization. We cannot afford to allow our children's future to be uncertain. Fighting against corruption is a effort to create a brighter future for our children. Corruption is not morally about immorality and irregularity. It is about injustice. So, ladies and gentlemen, we just have to bring those perpetrators to justice. It is an injustice because small numbers of people from their own greed steal the portion that is meant for the many. Small numbers of people enrich themselves for their own selfish satisfactions and leave the rest in poverty. People sacrifice themselves, working so hard day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, only for survival. On the other hand, a few people do not sweat, but are earning unlimited amount of income. Their unlimited income is unjustified income. This is injustice. We are witnessing today so many children who cannot attend school because their parents cannot afford it. There are so many children on the street hoping on the mercy of others, if only for a spoonful of rice. It is an undeniable fact that there are so many people who die before their time because they cannot afford to survive. At the same time, there is a small number of people who live in luxury with unlimited resources. This is also injustice. Those children enslave themselves at an early age because their opportunities have been taken away by those corrupt people. We at KPK judge these corrupt people thus. They take not only the children's opportunities, but they steal the children's future. Mahatma Gandhi once said, the earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. La Pai Dang Dao Sangro of Myanmar. Uh, 
Honorable Chief Justice Saranam, Trustees of the Raman Magsaysay Award Foundation, distinguished guests, fellow awardees, and friends, Minglava. First of all, I wish to offer my heartfelt thanks to the Raman Magsaysay Award Foundation and the Board of Trustees for acknowledging my work and including me in this year's illustrious list of awardees. In a way, my work has come full circle with this award. Soon after founding the Mita Development Foundation, in 1999, I came to the Philippines to study the former field school program, and it became a major cornerstone for our community-based programs. So I think it is very fitting that I'm being honored for work that had its beginnings in the Philippines over a decade ago. I'm deeply honored by this award, but also humbled in the knowledge that I owe it all to the host of wonderful friends, family, colleagues, and partners at home and abroad who have sustained me in my work with their wise counsel, help, and encouragement. So I accept this award not as a personal honor, but as a celebration of our collective achievement. I would like to offer my sincere thanks to the government of Myanmar, all ethnic leaders and communities, for opening the door for me to initiate, openly and freely, programs that would assist conflict or natural disaster affected communities across the country. I first embarked on the development journey quite inadvertently when in 1987, the late Miran Brang Seng, chairman of the Kachin Independence Organization, persuaded me to become involved in improving the situation of destitute people. Today, I thank him and the KIO leadership for directing me on this path. Sadly, as is well known, the ceasefire with Kachin was not sustained. After 17 years, fighting resumed in June 2011, with the result that villagers fleeing the conflict now make up a population of nearly 100,000 displaced persons. There are now over half a million refugees and internally displaced people around Myanmar, and as with all displaced and vulnerable people, the health and humanitarian needs are great. Without lasting peace, there can be no real development. But the political will and the current dialogue among ethnic, national, and government leaders provides hope for peaceful coexistence and harmony among people of different backgrounds. Thus, I will continue to be involved, wherever possible, in coordinating efforts to ensure that the voices of the Khmer people are heard in the ongoing peaceful transformation process. My Max Isai Award, coming at this crucial point in our nation's history, will, I trust, have drawn national and international attention to the efforts to find lasting solutions for union peace that will include all peoples and faiths. The cause of democratic transition is greatly encouraged by your compassionate concern. Gratitude, Gubasai. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Habiba Sarabi of Afghanistan. Honorable Chief Justice Sereno, trustees of the Ramon Magsaysay Award Foundation, distinguished guests, fellow awardees, and friends, assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Please accept the warm greeting of the Afghan people and the government. I feel very honored and proud to be selected for this year's 
Ramon Magsese Award. I would like to sincerely thank the esteemed foundation for the recognition. I also want to thank those who believed in me and my work and nominated me. This award also is your recognition of the citizens of Afghanistan, and especially women who have dedicated, dedicated their lives in service to building our country to do their daily hard work with the great honor, dignity, and perseverance. As citizens of the world, we can aspire to live a happy and simple life and yet achieve great heights. That is what President Ramon Magsese, as well as those who lived during his generation, proved. And to do, in today's complex world, ravaged by geopolitical interest and conflict resulting in economic hardship to the poor, we need to emulate such value of humility, simplicity, justice, and dignity. I feel honored because with this award, I am also being associated with my personal passion and goal for a greater role for women in my transitioning country. Women in Afghanistan today have risen above the confines of their homes. We have now prominent women politicians fighting for equality, housewife and businesswoman who are successful in their own rights, and activists and human rights champion who are working with a very proactive civil society. Within the government bureaucracy itself, we have raised over ourselves above, above common expectation and worked hard to promote balanced development and good governance. That is, that is why I feel this award recognizes all of these achievements. In accepting this award, I call upon the people and governments of our two countries to further strengthen the bond of friendship. Our two nations are located in the same continent, and we are bound much closer than we sometimes like to imagine. Ladies and gentlemen, upon returning to my country, one message I want to take back is the importance of selflessness and public service. I want to convey to my friends, colleagues, and the youth that we should never be selfish in our dedication to serve the people. Even when we are faced with adversaries and challenges, I will convey to my government to operationalize various good legis legislation that have been put in place so that, so that they support wholesome development in a transitioning society. And I want to tell Afghan women to continue their quest for, for knowledge and, and learning to be competitive. Ladies and gentlemen, within a year, my country will witness a turning point in our history. Again, women will be subjected to great tests. This period, without doubt, is a confusing period of uncertainty for us. But I am convinced that Afghans, both men and women, will prev uh, prevail and democracy will succeed ultimately. In conclusion, I like to say that this award is one that I, I will crush in my current work and future aspirations. The message that this award convey will help me to commit myself to work harder to build an efficient bureaucracy and support a vibrant democracy in my country. In my humble words, I hope to serve as a role model to young men and women. Last but not least,
let me express that I commit myself to live up to the ex expectation and ideal of this esteemed Ramun Maksese Award, and I thank you, thank, thank you once again for this great honor. Thank you very much. Shakti Samuha of Nepal, represented today by Sunita Danuar, the President, and Laksim, Laksmi Puri, the Treasurer. Honorable Chief Justice, uh, tr trustees of the Reborn Magasese uh, Award Foundation, distinguished guests, fellow awardees, and friends, Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Granting uh, the award to Shakti Sammo as the fifth awardee uh, from Nepal is a great honor and pleasure not only for my uh, colleagues and I, but also uh, for our uh, partners, funding agencies, media and NGOs, the Nepalese people and government. We would like, therefore, to express our deepest thanks to the trustees and staff of the Foundation for working very hard to select Sakti Samuha to receive this award. It confirms that our mission to abolish human trafficking is right and should be pursued. It has been very inspiring for me to see not only Sakti Samuha grow, but also to see more people get involved. Sakti stay involved and work harder for the best interests of women and children who are the most vulnerable groups in our society. I am sure this award will facilitate our work in this very hard struggle. Despite all our success, what we have achieved is still very small compared to the seriousness of human trafficking in Nepal, which needs continuous and integrated interventions to change public attitude and behavior. Breaking ground in the fight against trafficking is dangerous. We have encountered so many obstacles, including resistance from unreasonable conservative communities, threats from traffickers, and frustrations in the failure of the legal system to provide justice to survivors. We are also daily witness and listeners to violations against women and children. On a personal note, as a young female survivor leader, I have to overcome problems such as seniority and negative reactions to feminism. I face challenges in choosing appropriate and responsive strategies, selecting rights-based sensitive staff, enabling them to become more professional, and keeping them from burning out. But the suffering of survivors is what motivates us to continue this difficult mission. We have also learned a lot from this work. First, everything can be changed for the better, but this needs time, persistence, accurate information, and proper planning with inputs from victims 
and all stakeholders. Second, empowering survivors to deal with problems by themselves needs to be effective and efficient. I'm sure no one wants their daughters, sisters, and mothers to be trafficked. Third, a leader in this kind of work must be dedicated. If the leader is uncommitted and afraid, members, the staff, and the community will be the same. But if the leader is committed and brave, they will follow. Then everything is possible. Fourth, coordination and networking is necessary for success to gain strength and confidence from people and institutions that they work with. We struggled from our past when we spent a dreadful life, which was like living in hell. After struggling, we realized that being trafficked was not our fault. And we turned our tears into power. This is why we are now able to stand up. So I have learned to be optimistic in my life and in this Sakti Samuha journey. We at Sakti Samuha believe that society can be peaceful and prosperous only when men, women, and children hold hands together with equal dignity and respect. <laughs> this can be attained only with the participation and support from all sectors, not only from women's groups. To conclude, we are very encouraged by your recognition. Sakti Samoa would not be as successful today without help, without the help of our supporters. We hope the support continue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Maria Lourdes P.A. Sereno, Chief Justice of the Republic of the Philippines. Friends, please take your seats. Good afternoon, everyone. Former President Fidel Ramos, former Senator June Magsaysay, former Senator Harrison Alvarez, the honorable members of the Board of Trustees, including the former DDI Secretary Johnny Santos and the former Secretary of Foreign Affairs Delia Albert, my good friends uh, who preceded me in government, but most of all, the stars of today's affair, the awardees. Good afternoon. I thought a while why I was being asked to give a congratulatory message to the awardees of the Ramon Magsaysay Foundation. After all, the, any prestige I would lead to this organization would be at best marginal because indeed your lives are already shining. 
They are shining far brightly, even far more than the stars of Hollywood. So I did not think that a chief justice is really, really necessary for this occasion, except perhaps for one important lesson. Greatness lies really not in one's official position, but in how you lead, you lay down your lives for others. So ladies and gentlemen, please let us give a round of applause to these men and women who have laid down their lives for others. personal note, it is in fact very humbling to hear your life stories. Shakti Samuha, for example, who could have imagined that a young group of women, 15 to 18, would stop from looking at themselves as victims and turn their lives into stories of victory. Indeed. I was indeed deeply moved when they said, we will turn our tears into power. When you hear stories like the stories of the women of Shakti Samuha, I cannot help, for example, feeling a sense of shame for the times that I may have complained about my own condition, knowing that in your situation, how could you have mustered the courage to say that even though society has abandoned you and the system has rejected you, you were going to fight for yourselves and those of others who were similarly situated? It takes a different kind of heart, a different kind of understanding of one's self-worth to be able to stand up and face society and say, I am not to be blamed for having been trafficked. In fact, to listen to how they were able to transform their lives into very useful ones of leadership for women who have also been similarly victimized reminds us of the reality that it is always up to us to measure the worth of our lives whether we measure it in terms of how many calamities have visited us or whether we will transform our lives into powerful conveyors of goodwill to, to be powerful channels of blessing for others. Indeed, Shakti Samuha, young women as they are, would shame so many of us more mature people, supposedly older and wiser people, into re-examining our lives. So thank you for being here with us. Dr. Habiba Sarabi, I am amazed at what you have done for your country. You could have actually forsaken a life of danger and gotten back to Pakistan, or you could have gone to the West, where definitely a more lucrative career awaits you. But you were not unwilling to face death. You must have faced it several times already. You must have faced the derision and contempt of men which were shown you initially until you were able to show them that you were worthy of their every respect. Thank you, because I know the kind of courage that is required for someone in your situation to face up and to be the first in your, fa in your country, to, defer, to be the first in your history, in fact, in fact to be the fail, sole female governor of a country that is still reeling from decades and decades of intense armed struggle. Thank you very much for showing us how governance in an intelligent and efficient manner can still be introduced under the most dire situation. You offer us hope, especially those in countries where strife is still a known reality. Ms. Lenghai uh, Sengrao. No, let me check. Lapai Sengrao. 
thank you very much that uh, you are basically offering up your life in a way that is a story of gentleness, transforming the harsh realities that await minorities that are being persecuted. You have indeed trod on the path of great men, great men like Mahatma Gandhi in Asia, and even centuries before that, the faith that you carry with you, you as a Christian minority in Myanmar. You are twice a minority, so twice disadvantaged in every way. But there is no sense of bitterness in you at all. In fact, there is only loving kindness. <clears throat> Where this the story of leadership in all parts of the world, I do not know why hatred must still have a place. Indeed, the love that you have shown your people amidst all the violence and the call to the path of peace is one that offers us hope in this very confused world. Thank you very much, Ms. Engel. Komisi Pembarantan Korupsi. I got it right? I was afraid, actually, of saying something about your organization. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman and Vice Chairman, you must understand I am the Chief Justice <laughs> who has to keep her mouth shut even when she wants to say something so passionately. But I think you understand. You hear it from the applause of my people. <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially when mention was made of your 100% conviction rate. <laughs> of your having sent big fish to jail. And what is so remarkable is that the people rallied around you. You will just have to forgive me. I will have to keep my comments about you the shortest for fear of transgressing a line. So thank you for being there for all of us to admire. <laughs> Dr. Domingo, when I was a young professor in the College of Law, you were a chancellor in UP Manila. And of course, everyone was admiring the way you were handling administrative matters. But beyond this, what struck me was the fact that you said that medicine is basically a social science and that healthcare must stop being doctor-centered. In other words, in your mind and in your heart, it's all about people. So Dr. Domingo, In your advanced years, you are not even asking for any money to help government with its research analysis. So this is something very admirable because it shows that you are not willing to, you are not clinging to the usual perks of someone in your position. You could have retired, you could have rested, you could have spent a lot of time pottering over your garden or playing golf. But it shames us to think that even at this point in your life, you still very much care for universal health care. And I understand why, because the poor stare you in the face and you cannot live. Their pain is your pain and you carry their burdens in your heart without at any moment giving up being a professional. I admire that very deeply, Dr. Domingo. Allow me just to give a brief 
hope, a message of hope to the uh, Magsaysay Foundation. Because Dr. Uh, Mr. Johnny Santos was saying, will we still be relevant? Will the young people still embrace us? I think you should not give up hope. Because more than anything, people today are looking for authenticity. They will able, people will always be able to see a fraud. And because you have vetted all of these awardees, through a very long process, and you have le allowed others to speak and give testaments of their lives over decades, and you have witnessed firsthand evidence, I think the fact that you can say that your awards giving process is a very meticulous one, one that speaks of lives that have been shining across nations in this continent we call Asia. The message of authenticity is something that is deeply needed and admired. And, and believe me, even by the very young themselves. Am I not right? There. You have a young audience in the upper gallery. So please do not waver, and I congratulate you for thinking of this Magsaysay Institute of Transformative Leadership. I can hear their stories, and boy, your awardees today are fantastic organizational leaders. They can teach MPAs and MBAs, and they'll give them a run for their money, these well-paid professors we know. So, transformative leadership in a sense, because you have taken it as your key cause, is something that can carry your foundation through a long future. It is relevant, it is timely, it is both relevant and excellent, as Dr. Domingo said. So, with all the... the uh, the embarrassment that I feel that um, some of us in the public service may not have been doing as much for the cause of the public good. Please accept my warmest congratulations to the Foundation's Board of Trustees, officers, and I'm sure your hardworking staff as well. If you may, after all, you've been tolerating me for several minutes now. Allow me to just leave fil us Filipinos a few questions. If we were able to open up to the eyes of the Asian world, the noble ideals of self-sacrifice, heroism, and public service, and we were open up to the world the idea of establishing a parallel to the Nobel Prize that we will confer to our fellow Asians. Our fellow Asians have carried it far and wide, and their stories continue to amaze us. But their stories should not only just continue to amaze us, we should learn from them. We should ask ourselves why we have not deepened our hearts that yearn for revolutionary transformation in a deeper way. Why we have allowed the system to go rotten and inefficient. Why we have stopped caring. Why we have stopped doing what is best on a daily basis. Perhaps this is a new era also for us Filipinos. Perhaps we had been too comfortable or perhaps we were too afraid because of the complexity of the problems that are besetting us as a nation. It does not matter whether we are able to analyze all the problems that are besetting us. That does not count. It does not matter if they say that we have no hope and that we have always had so many starts and as equally not a good number of stops. That does not also matter. The only thing that matters if in our hearts we find the caring that is necessary for our fellow men that will allow us to forge a nation together. 
That is the only thing that counts. And whether we carry that burden in our hearts on a daily basis, and we are willing to wake up every day to serve our fellow men. That is the only thing that matters in life. So if we are being called now to a higher level of heroism, to a renewed sense of transformation of our society, to our examination of our values, we must welcome this. And we thank you all, that uh, the organizers, that here you continue to hold a beacon for us fellow Filipinos so that our efforts can be sustained because others have lit the way. We may have flagged earlier, but we are willing to renew our commitment to serving our country and our fellow men. So we thank this foundation, we thank the awardees, and to my fellow Filipinos, maganda pa ang kinabukasan natin. Marami pong salamat sa inyo. Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present to you the 2013 Ramon Magsaysay Awardees, Ernesto Domingo, <laughs> Comisi Pemberantasan Corupsi, Lapai Sengro, Habiba Sarabi, Shakti Samuha. The 2013 presentation ceremonies are now concluded. Thank you for your presence. May we request you to rise for the exit of colors. May we request everyone to remain standing until after the recessional. You may greet the 2013 Magsaysay awardees at the lobby and enjoy our exhibits. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>